this is our uh, first of two problem sets on this chapter, right? Waves on membranes. Uh, and I'll be sending out the quiz later today or maybe tomorrow, I don't know. So if you want to start on it, you can. You can. There are two problems on the quiz, and one of them is pertains to the material we're doing today. So, because the the deadline for that problem set is going to come quicker than normal. You know, we have the final dis problem discussion on a week from today, Thursday, and it's going to be due early in the week, the following week, right? Okay. So. All right. So these are actually, I think, interesting problems. Um, first one is 3.1, and we have a square membrane. All right, so this is the top view. This length is the same as that length. Uh, we're not told what this length is, so we're not going to be able to get definite frequencies. We can't calculate all this numerically. But we can still do a lot, as you will see. Um, so uh, this is, it's, it's oscillating in its normal mode. What's the normal mode here? Well, we did the theory for this, for all the modes. But the way you want to think, the way people usually think about it is, they think of a string, a string going along here the lowest mode is going to be the half wavelength mode, right? And similarly, a string going along here, it's going to be half wavelength. In this case, those two distances are the same. So we showed, theoretically, that what you do is you just multiply those two waveforms. So remember, for a string, the fundamental mode here is going to, be, is going to look like, the waveform is going to be the sine of kx, where K is 2 pi over the wavelength. And what's the wavelength here for a string? Not for the membrane, but for a string. It, this is half a wavelength. So the wavelength is 2A, right? So that's how I came up. I didn't even say it here. I just did it. Maybe I should have written a little more here. But this gives us the waveform going in this direction. And it's going to be the same in the other direction by symmetry, except we just replaced the x with a z. So this is what the fundamental wave looks like. And here's the full de time dependence. It's going at e to the i omega t. What is that frequency? Well, omega is equal to ck, right? And the k here is the square root of the sums of the squares of the individual k's in the x direction and the z direction. So this is all in the theory that we did, right? And this is one of, you know, this helps you learn it by going through these specific problems here. So each of the k's is the same, kx and kz. And so we get, this is the overall k. And now we just multiply it by c to get the frequency. And you remember I told you that the wavelength here is kind of, it's hard to get, it's hard to get a physical appreciation for. The wavelength here, once we know k, we take 2 pi over that to get the wavelength. So the wavelength is actually the square root of 2 times a. It's the distance from here to here, or here to here. Um, I should tell you what the meaning of this wavelength is. We find, through our process here, we find these frequencies. We found the frequency of the fundamental mode. If I had an infinite mem membrane and I drove it at that frequency, this would be the wavelength. That's the meaning of the wavelength. Because of our confined geometry here, it's hard to see w what the wavelength is here. You know, we kind of, s we, we see this as a half wavelength, but then that's just for a string, right? It gets influenced by what's going on here. So um, that shortens it from, this, from the wavelength, if you want to try to think of it crudely like that. But in the end, the wavelength here is the square root of 2 times a, for whatever it's worth. We just don't get a lot of information out of it. Uh, OK. Oh, by the way, to check on our solutions, we know the maximum amplitude has to be right in the center. And if you, you can check that, you go to the center coordinates here, a over 2, a over 2, <coughs> then we get a, we do get the amplitude. So that's why I put a check mark there. Sure. 
Yeah. So if you're looking at it, uh, the 1D perspective of the number, <coughs> the half wavelength is 1 over square root 2. So it's not actually a full sinusoid. <sighs> Yeah. Look, if this were a string, this would be half a wavelength, right? Yes. Now, it's not a string, it's a membrane. It's got curvature over there. So that's going to, I think what you're getting at is this statement I probably shouldn't have made. It's going to tend to reduce the wavelength, make it shorter. And it actually does, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, if this works for you, fine, but you want to be careful here. You know, the, here's the theory, here's the, the precise stuff is all here. And we really don't usually talk about the wavelengths here because it just doesn't have a lot of physical meaning to us in this confined geometry. So this is why I'm very careful. I, you know, when we say a half a wavelength here, that's for a string. It's not for this. This is not a half a wavelength for this system here. It's going to be less than that because we've got something going on in the other direction. The precise way to look at it is right here. We get the wavelength from the wave number. The wave numbers behave nicely. Okay, the total wave numbers, the sum of the, this is like perpendicular wave numbers. They add like vectors, okay? Once we get that, then we can get the frequency. But what you're saying is right. If, and if it works for you, that's good. But just be careful, okay? <laughs> be careful. You just, people tend not to think in terms of wavelengths when they look at problems like this. Okay, uh, the average displacement. I wonder why, why, how could that be important? So when this thing is up here like this, let's say at a turning point, here's our membrane, right? and it's up here you know, at a turning point, the average displacement is going to be somewhere between 0 and A, right? Why would somebody want to calculate that? Can anybody think why you might? This is, uh, if you replace this with a circle, this could be the diaphragm of a microphone, and that's the, the voltage you're going to pick up is going to be proportional to the average displacement. That's how the capacitance is changing. We'll see all this in the future, but I just want to point out to you that this is not just some mathematical <coughs> exercise here. KFCS asked us, because they, they were all acousticians, right? So that's why they're asking us to do this. It's, it's sort of looking ahead to apply this to microphones. So the average value, I'm taking this at a turning point, right? I dropped the e to the i omega t, so we're just looking at the spatial part here. You have to integrate this over the surface and divide by the surface area. That's the definition of the average here, right? It's like we're summing all the values up and then dividing by the total, okay, total area. So um, we just substitute in our waveform here. And by symmetry, we have a double integral here, but both integrals are going to be the same. I'll let you look through this. That's why I end up just squaring one integral. We're going to be multiplying one integral by another integral that's identical. And you just do this, carefully do it, and, and beat on it, and eventually you find that it's about 0.4, which is reasonable. It should be roughly a half, right? You would think it'd be roughly <coughs> a half. Should it be a little greater than a half or a little less than a half? I don't know. I kind of see with this tying it down here, it's going to lower the average. Of course, I know the answer, <laughs> but uh, if we didn't know this answer, I think we might guess that it should be probably less than a half. It seems reasonable. Anyway, this is the value. And again, this has applications in capacitive microphones. Uh, any questions so far? This next thing is bizarre. And I invite you to do it. I made this is optional, okay, this part C here. But there's going to be a locus of points, okay, there's going to be a, some kind of curve here that corresponds to half the maximum amplitude. You know, somewhere around here, right? What's, what do you think that shape's going to be? Well, it can't be a square. It, it's, got, that's, it's, going to be, it's got to be smooth. That just seems unreasonable. That the, the points here where you have half the, the maximum amplitude, that just doesn't seem right. So it's going to be curved. And um, we can write down mathematically how to solve for that. Okay. We want this to be one half. You know, we want one half the amplitude. So that means this has to be one half. Now we can solve 
for z if we like, and you get this. So you can then plot z as a function of x. But you're going to have to be a little bit careful here. You might put in some x values here where you're using the inverse sine of something greater than 1. What's, the, what's, what's an angle whose sine is greater than 1? Does that angle exist? It, in the comple a complex angle will exist, but not a real angle. So you're going to be limited here. Right, Al, if you're interested in doing this, I've never done it, but Professor, in Professor Baker's solutions for this problem, which, which uh, you have, it's in the, on the Sakai side. I think there's a couple of other partial solutions from KFCS and then partial solutions from somebody else. I think those are Baker's. I'm pretty, pretty sure. <laughs> Professor Baker's. So you can look on there. It turns out to be very close to a circle, which I think is surprising. It turns out to be very, clo very close to a circle. But it can't be a circle, right? There's, there's no way that, the, that this, you know, this doesn't represent a circle. A circle is x squared plus y squared is equal to some, a radi you know, some radi the radius squared. But it is um, remarkably close to a circle. So if anybody gets interested in this and you want to do it, just let me, you know, show me the results, okay? I'd be interested. Uh, okay, so that's the first problem. Any questions? Or comments? Okay, the next one is, is the next one, 3.2. 3 now we have a rectangular membrane where it's twice as long as it is wide. Now, I chose to draw, draw it this way, but you could just as easily, I don't know why I did this. Um, probably more reasonable, <laughs> I think most people would draw it this way. Landscape rather than portrait, and 2a would be the, the x distance here, but it doesn't matter, just take, pick one and just stick with it, right? So we solved this problem in general. You look back at the solution. We solved it for any length here. L, we called it L sub X, capital L sub X, and any length here, L sub Y. Here's the spectrum. Here are the possible frequencies. Starting with N equals M equals one. That's gonna be the fundamental. <coughs> Both N and M are one. Well, in this case, we don't know these distances, but we know that this one, we know that LZ is twice LA, LX. So we put this in, um, put this information in here. And now to proceed with this and to look at the higher modes, that's what we're gonna be doing here. What you wanna do is get this A out of here. Bring this A out of here. And in fact, to make it easy to calculate, I'm going to bring out a, I'm going to clear all the fractions. It's good to clear all the fractions from here. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and leave them in there. Okay, you see how I have no fractions here. There's just this overall fraction. It gets real tedious when you start punching in and calculating these things. It's easy to make a mistake. So that's why I took out, I took out not just an A, I took out a 2A. See how I took out a, from, going from here to here, I took out a 2A. Okay, rather than associating the two with this where I have to deal with a fraction, I, put, I made it a, a four here. All right, so the, I want to really emphasize this, and it's, the KFC has asked you to do this, and there's a, there's a reason for it. What we want to look at here, we cannot determine the fundamental frequency because we don't know A, right? But even if we could, it's still useful when we rank the modes, and this is a basic part of this problem here. What, is, what are the rankings of the modes? What is the order of their frequencies? You know, how do you, okay, how shall I say this? How do you, what, what are the modes in order of increasing frequency? So what is the order of the modes? What you want to look at is you want to normalize the frequencies. Where is it? Right here. And even if we could determine this numerically, we'll see a problem, an example of that later. It's really good to look at these ratios here. This is a standard thing to do. So all of these numbers here, except for n equals m equals one, they're gonna be greater. These numbers are gonna be greater than one. And they, what they are is the ratio of, of each mode to the fundamental. It's a very natural way to look at it, a very clean way to do it. 
So I made a table here. Here's n, n equals 1, 2, 3. Here's m, 1, 2, 3, 4. And I'm going to go along here and determine these quantities. I'm going to punch these in. Okay? We get, of course, 1 for the fundamental because it's normal, everything's normalized to the fundamental. And then you march along here and you just do this. And we're only asked for the, we're asked for the first four overtones. So eventually I realized that these, these aren't going to make it. They're going to be, a, they're going to be higher frequency. So I just didn't, I didn't bother to calculate them. That's why I put a dash line there. So now, and oh, and this, this algorithm here, there's no shortcut. I remember I told you guys there's no formula. There's no analytical formula that you can, given a certain aspect ratio, you know what the rank, what the order of the frequencies are, is. How to rank them in terms of increasing frequency. You actually have to do it. You gotta do this. So, we just pick them off here. Here's the, the fundamental, of course, is the lowest. What's the next mode? The one, two, right? Because it's the lowest next number. Because these are the ratio of the frequencies. So the, we just look at how these ascending order of, of the numbers are. Those, that's going to be the order of the, of the modes in, in, with respect to frequency. So the next mode up is going to be the one, two mode. Okay? That's going to be the next mode. What's the next one up? Yeah. And you've got to do this. There's no, unless you, you know, maybe on the internet there's some kind of algorithm where you can punch all this in and it'll tell you what the orders, what the, what, what the order of the modes are for increasing frequency. But what that algorithm is doing is precisely what we're doing right here. It's, it's, there's, there's no shortcut. <coughs> so this is the we have the fundamental, this is the first overtone. This is going to be the second. This is going to be the third. And what's the fourth? Ah, it's degenerate. So there are two modes here that have the same frequency. Those are called degenerate modes, as I mentioned yesterday. So that's where we're going to stop, because they asked for the first four overtones. So the answer to the question is, the, um, the lowest is the fundamental. The next mode is the uh, one, two mode then the 1-3, then the 2-1, and then finally, for the first four overtones, there are actually two modes that are the next up. They both have the same frequency. So if you have a driver, some kind of, this is a sound, and this will happen next quarter in, in a laboratory, in an experiment, and you're driving an enclosure here, what's going to happen when you drive at a, this frequency here? going to get complicated, right? Because in general, you're going to excite both modes. Yes? So I don't understand. I don't quite understand what's the order of the overtone. We have all these modes, right? And the natural way to, to handle them and deal with them is to rank them according to ascending, ascending frequency. So this is the lowest mode. The F11 is the lowest mode. The next mode is going to be the 1-2 mode. So that's what we're talking about here. We're making a, and you can see here, the 1, 2 mode is 1.265 times the frequency of the fundamental. The, this one is 1.612 times. This is higher up. So we're simply placing them in order of increasing frequency. And this is, so, this is very natural. Because for one thing, as you know, we have analyzed, we, we sweep frequencies, and so you want to be able to identify modes if you've got a, a frequency sweep. You're going you're gonna to want to know what the order of the, what this order is here, theoretically. So it's a very natural thing to do. Um, I added this. Here's um, how we, how nearly everyone views these modes. The fundamental has no interior nodes, right? The nodes are only on the boundary. The next mode up, which is the one, two mode, is going to look like this. All the modes have by, we have this boundary condition here. They're all fixed along here. This is going to be a node. So we see from a string point of view, we have a half a wavelength here and we have a full wavelength here, right? Because we have the one, two mode. So this is how we can represent the nodal structure. We represent the mode this way. Yes? So uh, yesterday we talked about um, 
it all involves the ratio of LX to LZ. Yeah. Much, much greater. Is this just proving that two times equals much, much greater? Because the two LX is two times LZ. That's yeah. not much, much greater. Well, that's what I'm saying. But this follows suit to what the notes were saying. What we talked about yesterday where it said if one is much, much greater, then it's going to follow the one, 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 two. Oh, one, yeah. Two, okay. Right, so we can look at this from a more extreme case here. Suppose, you know, we have this being twice that. Suppose this were much less. Suppose the ratio was much greater, right? What's the order? And, and you're, you're driving this with some driver and you, 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 you hit these modes as the frequency slowly changes. What are the modes going to look like as you increase frequency? Here's the, the first one beyond the fundamental. This is going to be the next one. What's going to be the next one? going to be this. <laughs> okay, because remember now we got this is very tiny here, right? So you're going to have a ton of these modes before you hit, before you hit this one. Okay. Before, excuse me, before you hit this one. Yeah. Before you hit this one. And you can see here, you know it's going to happen because this is really small here. This is a tiny wavelength. It's characteristically a wavelength. You have to be careful. Remember about what I was telling you. But um, so you're going to have to go to a high index here, this index, this n value here. You're going to have to go to a pretty high value before you finally start to excite a mode that varies across this way. All these other modes are going to have no variation. If, if this were sound and I had a microphone and I moved the microphone along here, what do I pick up as I, as I go from, if I, if I start anywhere here and move in the x direction? Uniform. It's uniform. So you'll finally pick up this at a sufficiently high frequency. And here are the uh, degenerate modes. So these two obviously have the same wavelength. If you can see that they have the same wavelength, uh, come and talk to me. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't see that. But uh, you can play this game with wavelength. And I think everybody does. They probably don't like to admit it, but it's very qualitative, okay? It's just to give you a physical feel. The bottom line here is the wave number. That's as I was telling you before. That's how we calculate. That's what's in the theory and that's how we calculate this stuff. It's not on here, but we saw it back here, right? It's the wave number. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, so now we're going to do, this is a good problem, okay? We're going to do, uh, oh, we're going to do a square. It's a square membrane, but it's fixed. The displacement is fixed. There's zero displacement along three of the links here, and then one of the links, we'll choose it to be this one, it's free. So now we have to go back to the theory. We got to redo the theory, right? We didn't, we did, class we did it where it's clamped all the way around, right? So if you go back and go back to the beginning of the theory, the first thing we did was we solved the wave equation and we said nothing about boundary conditions. Remember? So, um, no, I forget I said I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a different problem, never mind. The way to look at this, because it's rectangular here, well, it's actually a square, but in general it's going to be rectangular. The way to look at this, and I think the way most people do it, is the string idea, right? In this direction, if I think of this as a string here, it's a fixed free string. So what's the fundamental waveform going to look like? Quarter wavelengths, right? It's going to be a quarter wavelength. The boundary condition here is that it has to be no slope because it's free. So we're going to have a quarter wavelength here. What's the um, fundamental going this way? Well, it's one wavelength, one sinusoid here. That's, that's the fundamental. So in general, what we have, we can just lift this, knowing, because we know the theory here. We know we need to multiply these two waveforms, the X waveform and the Z waveform. We just write these down, and we're really, we can just use string theory here to do this. So in the z direction, we have a fixed, fixed string. Remember z waveforms? They look like this. The sine of kz, k is m pi over l. 
that, that starts off with a half wavelength, one wavelength, three halves of wavelength. That's, that's all in here. We did this. Okay? And then we redid it for longitudinal motion of bars. Same thing. What about the fixed free? Well, we already said the fundamental is going to be a quarter wavelength. The next one here for a string is going to have, it's going to look like this. It's going to be three quarters of a wavelength, right? I think everybody remembers this. Yeah, it's going to look, so for a string we get this. That's the first mode. The next one looks like this, right? So we're fitting in a quarter of a wavelength here, and here there's one, two, three quarters of a wavelength, and etc. So once I know these waveforms, our theory tells us all we have to do is just multiply them. That's the waveform. I, I don't think we need this. This is just old stuff that I think everyone's familiar with right here. Our theory tells us that we multiply these two, that for the membrane, we just take the product here. And this is a normal motor. It has some frequency omega. How do we determine the frequency? Omega is equal to CK. K is the square root of the sum of the squares of the individual Ks. And the individual Ks is what's multiplying Z here and X here. So I substitute those in here. And we now have our spectrum. Those are the possible frequencies of the normal modes. <clears throat> okay, and it's of course going to be different. It's of course different than the, if it were tied down all the way around. Uh, so what are we asked to, to do here? Uh, yeah, find the frequency of the find the frequency of the fundamental and write a general expression for the natural frequencies and for the normal modes. Well, that's our solution here. Here we are. This is it. This is the waveform. And, we, and again, we don't have a string, but it's helpful to look at this from a string point of view. A string this way and a string that way. There's the X string with mixed boundary conditions, fixed free. There's the Z string. And here's our spectra. Uh, this is, these are normal modes, and here's the, the frequencies. They're given by this. Uh, sketch the nodal patterns for the three normal modes with the lowest natural frequencies. Okay, again here we're going to look at the, we focus on the fundamental, always it's the most important mode. Here's the angular frequency. We get this. Now we can't numerically find this, okay, because we don't have the information on what the speed of waves is and what the length is. But we, it's still useful to use as a normalizing factor. So the natural way to look at the frequencies is to divide them by, and then, and then this C and L is going to go away. It's much simpler. We're going to get purely numerical <coughs> results if we look at the normalized frequencies. That's what we did before. So here they are. I don't like this one half, and you won't either if you start punching these things in. So I'm going to clear that. See how I've got these all integers now. I just have to deal with this overall factor of five right here. So now, I don't know what the rankings of these, does anybody know? Can you tell me what, what the first three or four, whatever they want? We don't know, we have to calculate. So here we go, here's a table, another table similar to before, here's N, here's M, um, and I'm writing in the values of the ratios. Oh, I actually wrote in how I got this number. I, this can be frustrating. You can easily make mistakes here. <laughs> so I have this vague memory of being frustrated by this and finally saying, okay, I'm going to write down, I'm not going to just go for this number, I, or something happened, I can't remember. Right, you, of course, can do whatever you want to do, just get the right answers. Um, so I'm marching along here doing these calculations, and once we have these, now we, can, we know the rankings of the modes, right? This is the lowest mode. What's the next one up? Uh, it looks like this, the 2-1 mode, is the next one up. And then, then the 1-2 the mode, right? And then, I don't know if they wanted to know, but the, the fourth mode is, the, the, fourth, the next one up is going to be the 2-2 um, two, two mode. So you can keep going like this, however modes that you're interested in, you need to know. 
Uh, so here are the first three nodes. Now we got a little bit of a problem. Um, I'm going to switch the, the, the designations here. The solid lines are going to be nodes and the dashed lines are going to be anti-nodes. Now before I was, I was using interior nodes, I made them dashed. Remember that? These are nodes, right? And I put a node there. <coughs> okay, I don't want to do that anymore. I, I, want to, I want to make them, if it's a node, I'm going to make it like what it is on the, on the border here. Because I want to be able to, to get a feeling for the waveforms in here. I want to, um, I need to know what the anti-nodes are. So now, here's what we've got. Here's the fundamental. It's kind of doing this. It's, uh, it's hard to... It's tied down here, but not tied down there. It has to come in with zero slope here, right? But as you go from here, it's got to be fixed here or not there. So as you come across here, it kind of looks like this, right? It's tied down here, and it comes in with zero slope, and it has a maximum amplitude there. And as you, as you move along this direction, this is an anti-node, because it's z just by the same token here. As you move anywhere here, this starts off at zero, reaches a maximum there, right, and goes down. So this is an anti-node. This take, you have to take some getting used to. I freely admit that. Okay. So here's the fundamental. Here's the next one up. We know from our calculations that it's the 2-1 mode. And this is now going to have, because it has three, from string theory, it has, a, it has three quarters of a wavelength. Theory. There's going to be a node going across here. Right? Because of this, because we're in the next mode up here. Remember, it's this one. Going in the x direction, it looks like this. So we've got a node there. And similarly, we have, a, we have our anti, this is going to be an anti node. And you can just keep going. Like, here's what's happening now for the 1, 2 mode. We still have just a quarter wavelength here. But now we pick up another, it's, more than, it's not just a half a wavelength, we have one full wavelength. So we're going to, as we move this way, we're going to go through a node here. Because it's going like this. In this direction, it has this one wavelength. And then here's the mixed mode, the 2-2 two, two mode. And you can actually probe this. You know, if this were sound, you can put a microphone in there and you're going to do it next quarter. Professor? For, for circular geometry, yes? Do you kind of switch the convention like, based on like, what kind of boundary conditions you have? Or yeah, I'm going to do what's, what's convenient for me. <laughs> right? You should think the same way. You want to do what's convenient for whatever you're working on. You know, you should, you know, we're not, there's, there's no magical, it's not written in stone that dashed lines are, are nodes and solid, okay? You do what's convenient. And this, what, this would seem convenient to me. If you can find something better, let me know. Right? Color, well, nowadays a lot of times people will use color, okay? But you know, I'm the black and white generation, right? When I was a kid, my parents, when my parents finally got a television, <laughs> okay, uh, it was black and white. And, and the, the screen was like kind of circular. I think it was really circular, but it looked so weird that they blocked off part of it to make it look more rectangular. Do you guys have any idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. So anyway, you know, you use what's convenient for you. And this is part of, of technical, um, you know, science and engineering. You can use color here, whatever, just so you get a feel. We need to get a feel for these, feel for the modes, right? And this is, this, this seems reasonable to me. Okay, other questions or comments? I think, is that it for this one? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the water cooler problem. Uh, KFCS, is, you can read it, right? Although it may be hard to do physically, it is not hard to imagine a circular membrane with a free rim. Okay? Well, it can be done, okay? And it's easy, and you've all done it, okay? If you have a cup of water or coffee or whatever, and um, you look at surface waves on there, this theory, the, the, our membrane theory, will apply. Now, there's a, one condition for to to have a uh, for it to precisely apply. The, the depth has to be shallow, 
as I told you before, water waves are non-dispersive. We hit the wave equation for water waves only when the wavelength, typical wavelength, is large compared to the depth. All right, and that'll just change. That's not going to change the waveforms, but it'll change the frequencies. So I want you to imagine here that we have a we have a um, we have a dish that's kind of relatively shallow compared to the wavelengths in here, and we're we can take the membrane theory, it tells us the normal modes, the standing wave modes. It's exact. So that's, that's the standard application here. So here's what our theory tells us. Here are the waveforms, the standing waveforms, the normal waves. We have this, you know, the dreaded Bessel function. Okay. Oh, so the moral of this, remember the Bessel story yesterday that I gave you? I guess the moral there is never trust an undergraduate <laughs> because he was, he was wrong. It, it sounded good. He, he, he left the Bernoullis or one of the Bernoullis out of it. it was more, it's more complicated. And the history of science is almost always like that. How many of you have taken a history of science course? U universities have them. I took one. They love to talk about the bomb, the World War II, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That, that's, a, that's a favorite topic. So, um, so no one's taken a history of science course? <laughs> it sounds good, right? Oh, is it going to be an easy course? I think you should teach a 4,000 animal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you, it's hard. Um, science, science historians, it's a tough job because they need to know the technical. You can't dig into the uh, history of science without being aware of the technical stuff, you know? So it, it turns out, and st strange things happen. It's very complicated how progress is made. I mean, it's just unbelievably complicated. And it was more complicated than, than I thought. For, for, you know, it's, so I sent out a message about this, right? And uh, James probably posted this. I got something. Uh, James was the one that pointed this out. And the Encyclopedia Britannica was the best one. Wikipedia didn't have the history. Or well, I couldn't find it. I'm really disappointed. <laughs> That's it, I'm not giving them any money. <laughs> okay, uh, anyway, that's another story. So, um, all right. So I want you to think of these as surface waves here. Uh, shallow container, circular container. We know the solution. This is it, this is the same as a membrane. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, here's, at this point, here's what I wanna say is, Here's what I need to say. This is a solution to the wave equation in a circular geometry. We have not yet put in the boundary condition, right? And here's what it is. I dropped the gamma, the phase constant, because that's not going to be important for us here. So just to make it easier, I dropped the plus gamma. If you look back, you'll see that this is what we got from the wave equation in polar coordinates without specifying any boundary conditions. So. Here's where we start to do this problem. We don't have to redo this. We've already done, we've gotten that. It's the imposition, whatever the word is, of the boundary conditions. That's, that's where we start here. We start with the solution to the wave equation. The boundary condition is no slope, okay? So the water in here, for small amplitudes, when it's uh, on the, the, the boundary here, it looks like this. It comes in with no slope. That's the boundary condition. Similar to a free string. Same as this free string or free membrane, which is what, how KFCS are stating the problem. So what we have to do here is take the derivative with respect to R and set R equal to A and demand that that's zero. And we're, that's only going to work for certain discrete values of K. This is how we discrete, how we get our discrete frequencies when we impose the boundary condition here. So that's why I've gone ahead and put in the KMN here. The M refers to the order of the Bessel function, and the N is just any one of a number of zeros here. Except now, instead of dealing with the actual zeros, we're dealing with you know zero crossings. We're dealing with max and mins, where the slope is zero. And the notation here is fairly clever. They, uh, we still use a lowercase j to denote the zeros, but we put a prime on there. So this denotes the zero of the slope. Of, big J prime, okay? So that's the standard notation. Remember, without that, that would be these zeros right here, okay? We want the zeros where there's, that's what's relevant for our boundary condition. So these are tabulated, they're in the back of KFCS, you can look them up, right? 
and they can only be solved for numerically unless you get sort of sufficiently out here then, you, then there are analytical asymptotic approximations. Uh, one thing you want to note here, and this has always caused confusion for me, is, and this is the convention, you'll notice that at zero here, this has zero, uh, J zero has zero slope here, right? So the first one here, the first root, is not going to be useful for us because it corresponds to zero frequency. It's not a mode. So we have to rule, we rule that one out. Okay, what are the orders of the modes? You don't know. You have to look at these. Here they are. I've written these down from the back of the book to three figures. Um, it's how these are ordered. That's going to tell you what the orderings of the modes are. So if you look in there, and you, should all, you all should do that, um, here's the first one. The next one up in value is the J21 prime, and then the J02, and then um, here's the J31, that's the next one. So I've written down the first four, I don't know what they asked for, but I don't really care. The, here are the first four modes. The first mode is the one you've all seen in a car, when <laughs> or it's, and I think everybody calls it the sloshing mode. So that's the lowest frequency mode. That's the fundamental. The next one is not here, it's this mode. So this is kind of like the sloshing mode, but instead of going like this, you know, these are up, these are down. I don't know if I can do this. Um, it goes like this. Right? When these are up, those are down. Then when these are up, those are down. So it's kind of like you have a couple of wavelengths around here. If you want to think in crudely in terms of wavelength. This turns out to be the next mode. It's not till the third mode that we get to the water cooler mode. And this is the mode that looks like, looks like this. So here we are, here's equilibrium in our container here. And there's going to be this mode that looks something like this. And then half a cycle later, it looks like this. This is bigger, this has a bigger amplitude. These are Bessel functions, okay? It's not sinusoid, this has a bigger amplitude. And here is the, um, those are the nodes. So this is what you would see if you looked at it from this direction. The top view, you'd see this. This is, when this is up, this is all down. Okay, this is a nodal circle. Everybody get the picture? So that's the water cooler mode. And what tends to happen here is the bubble coming up doesn't excite this because it doesn't have the right symmetry. Can you see that? So, and also tends not to, for the same reason here. So when the bubble comes up and cause, breaks through the surface, it tends, it favors the, the m equals zero mode. It favors, this is the first, the lowest mode that it favors. So these tend not to be excited. And this can last for, I've seen it, this can last, has anyone ever seen this before? It's beautiful. It's a Bessel function. So you can tell people that in the office. You can tell them that oh, it's a Bessel function. You know? um, now, what if we have? What if it's not shallow? Uh, we don't have the wave equation anymore, right? So what do you think is going to happen there? The frequency will not be right. Our formula for the frequency won't be right. But I think the waveform is going to be the same, I, I would think. I've, never, I've actually never had thought of this until, until just before class. Wouldn't it, uh, wouldn't it not matter as much as long as the amplitude wasn't too big? This is all assuming small amplitude. A whole theory here, right? So Don't confuse wavelength with amplitude. They're in perpendicular directions here. So we're now talking about this, for all this theory to go through for the water, it has to be shallow compared to the typical wavelengths. And it's always, all, the whole theory is always small amplitude. So, but what happens when we have typical water cooler cases, cooler, it's not going to be shallow, right? But the, uh, the amplitude of the wave is only at the top, and they usually stay very shallow. 
So I don't know what you're. Uh, so the, the amplitude of the vessel function would still be small compared to the wavelength. Oh, it. Um, well, I, uh, it could be. I don't know. I've seen some pretty good waves and, you know, pretty good amplitudes. But, so there's, there's several things that we can consider here. One of them is amplitude. That can affect, that's going to affect the waveform and the frequency, okay? So, but we take care of that right from the beginning. This is, this is all linear, okay? So we're going to assume small amplitudes. But how is it going to change now when we go to deeper? Well, I think it's just going to change the frequency. Because we don't have omega is equal to ck anymore. You know, we don't have, I wrote it in here actually. For, here's, for shallow water waves, here's the speed. When you get at some, this is the height of the liquid in equilibrium. When you get to, um, you get to bigger depths, it's, it's, um, it depends upon wavelengths. The speed changes upon wavelengths. So I think what's going to happen here with a water cooler is just going to change the frequencies of these modes. Uh, but not the waveforms. I think the waveforms are going to have to be the same, and I have to think about that. But it seems almost obvious to me, but that makes me suspicious because I'm, I'm almost always wrong. <laughs> so I'll think about that. Now, um, it turns out it's been 10 years. I had a couple of thesis students, and what we were working on was a rocking pot oscillator. How many of you have seen, if you have an electric, this is gonna sound crazy to you, like I've all jumped to some completely different planet or something, but I'm gonna connect it up here. Um, an electric stove with a pot on there that almost always is not gonna sit, it can rock back and forth, it doesn't sit uniformly. It can go into oscillation. How many people have seen that? Yeah. Okay, a few of you. So I, I'm not making this up, right? <laughs> and it, it can be really annoying unless you start to think about it like a physicist would think about it. Well, how can it do that? How can this just constant heat derive these oscillations? Well, I'll let you think about that. There's very little literature on this. We did a literature search, very little literature. So we were exploring this. One of the things we wanted to do is to have a demo for the nonlinear course, because this is an example of a maintained oscillator. The drive here is evidently the heat, and it's the heat is not oscillating at the frequency of this rocking. It, the heat's just constant. You know, so there's a feedback, some kind of feedback going on here. This is a maintained, as I mentioned to you before, I think, a maintained oscillator, right? So what we found was, we were trying to understand this, we would excite surface wave modes, and that would uh, affect the rocking. So it got complicated, right? It's also hard to reproduce this. It's, it's tricky. Anyway, in our doing our research, we had to be able to describe these modes, quickly describe the modes so that we could talk about them and write about them, and you get really tired of this notation. The 1-1, one, one, the 2-1, it, it gives you a headache after a while. So we gave them names. So here are the names. This, uh, well, this is standard, sloshing, rifle scope, water cooler, right? <laughs> Obvious. Nuclear, yeah, that, that, that was a no-brainer. Pie mode, okay, yeah. A keyhole mode, this is my favorite. And I, don't, I think one of the students did this, metric pie. Well, there's 10. There's, there's, there's eight here, there's ten. <laughs> so we called it the metric pie mode. Yeah, I wish I had thought of that, but I'm pretty sure it was one of the, this is a joint thesis, and I'm pretty sure one of the students came up with that. Uh, camera focus, yeah, pretty obvious, huh? bullseye mode. We, we, we did it out of necessity, just so we could try to describe it, and we would excite more than one mode, it would depend upon the heat, because that would change the frequency, so we would excite different modes. Yeah, it got really complicated and, and interesting. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, the final problem is simple, and this is a, this is a good problem. It's all numerical, okay? Um, so we have a circular membrane. We know the density, <coughs> the mass per unit area. We know the tension. You know, it's the force per unit length, remember? It's this weird quantity, kind of weird quantity. And we want to find the first the four lowest frequencies. Oh, and it's fixed along the perimeter, okay? So we know, here's our, we know the theory here. Here's, a, I'm just reminding you, 
Here's how we get it for, for fixed boundary conditions. We, let's go ahead and calculate the speed of waves. Standard. It's 158 meters per second. What I've done here, I've, I've actually written the zeros of the Bessel function here. Bessel functions. This is from KFCS. And because that's going to tell us what the ordering of the frequencies are. Because remember, the, the, the frequency is proportional to the root here, J and N. So that's going to tell us how they're ordered. Here's the, uh, the fundamental mode. Remember, this is fixed. This is the simple 0, 1 mode. It looks like this. I don't know, it's really simple, right? It's just going like this. And um, this is a universal ordering. There's no aspect ratio here. All we have is a radius, and it's, a, it's not going to matter. So this is all modes that are clamped, where the, where the membrane is fixed around the end. They're all going to have the same ordering, no matter what the radius is or any other parameters, as long as you have that boundary condition. We can find the fundamental. Here's the frequency of the fundamental. It's 241 hertz. It is still useful to use the scaling, even though we're going to make this all numerical. You don't want to have to keep calculating this for the other modes. So we just scale it. We, we, go, we normalize it to the fundamental. So I get this, and then I can substitute in. What am I doing here? Oh, then I'm going to multiply through. So what I'm going to do, this is a natural thing to do. To get these frequencies, I'm going to just multiply by a scale factor the fundamental frequency. So it's a standard thing. Instead of having to recalculate, I think it's really boring. If you don't believe me, try it. So here they are. Here's the order, this universal ordering. Here's the next mode up. It's the slosh. Well, I don't know if we should call it the sloshing mode, but it's this mode, OK? The, um, the, Z, the um, this is the 1-1 one, one mode, OK? And you calculate it has this frequency. Here's the next one up. And then here's the, um, remember, this is not the water cooler mode, right? So, so this one, it looks like this, but it's fixed. It's fixed here. But it has a nodal diameter here. This is the 0, 2 mode. 0 has azimuthal symmetry, and it has one node here. How do you, and here's the final thing, it's an interesting problem. How do you find the diameter or radius of this nodal circle here? Well, we have the waveform. It's kind of written small here. Here's the waveform. Okay, this is the 0, 2 mode right here. It's M equals 0, it's azimuthally symmetric. And we got an interior node, we're at 2 instead of 1. So I, uh, it looks like this. I now substitute in what K02 is, and I get J02 over A. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this. When R is equal to A, they cancel, and I get J0 of little j of a 0. It's going to be 0, right? But look what happens when R is less than A. There's going to be a specific value of R where we reduce J02 to J01, and that's how we're going to get a zero. So that, that is how you can calculate this. You demand, you demand that this quantity is, J, is <laughs> I can't read this, is J01. You demand that this is equal to J01. That's going to give you a zero here. Because the little j's are the roots. And now you solve for r, and you get uh, 10.9 centimeters. OK? You can look at that. And if you have any questions about homework, you, know, you can always ask me. Right? <laughs>